Yo, what's poppin' everybody? Welcome back to the podcast, another episode of Caffeine and Green with your man, Connor Cardenas. And per usual, I just want to make sure that you guys are heading to 3072 El Cajon Boulevard. That's right. That is the address for the Caffeine and Green brick and mortar, baby. That's right. Come on in. Mondays were closed, but Tuesday through Saturday, we are open from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then on Sundays, we're open at 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. So guys, cruise on in any day of the week except for Mondays. Get a latte, get some coffee, get some bags of coffee, merch, whatever you want. We're serving it all here at Caffeine and Green. So make sure that you're cruising in. Come in today and I will make you some coffee. All right. My guest today is Danny Riggins. She is the owner of Ultrea Coffee over in the college area. It's actually on El Cajon Boulevard, just as like Caffeine and Green is, but she's deeper, you know, deeper inland. So it's over by San Diego State. She has been in business for about four and a half years, and um, we didn't know each other. I mean, like we've been on a panel together once for roasting, but other than that, we don't know anything about each other. And I have to say, it was such a pleasant conversation. She has such a cool story, li- talking about van life, talking about business life, talking about just being in coffee for a long, long time and, um, you know, the trials and tribulations and ups and downs and how to pivot with COVID and just, man, yo, mad respect to Danny. Real talk. I think you guys are going to enjoy this conversation. It was definitely one of my, uh, one of my favorites as of late. So without further ado, my homegirl, Danny Riggins. This is your time to shine, homegirl. Let's go. Give me cap, 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 And we're live. Danny Riggins. Yes, I got it. We're welcome to Caffeine and Green. Thank you. <laughs> Boom. Every time. Every time. Um, Danny, I'll just get right into it. You own Ultrea Coffee. I do. Yes. And for people who don't know, for the listeners around the world, where is that located? It's at College in El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego, California, right by SDSU, essentially. Okay. Uh, what, 70th, you said? No, El Cajon and College. El Cajon and College. Sorry. Yeah. I was thinking El Cajon Boulevard and 70th. That's where, when I first moved into San Diego, I lived um, in this house behind the Shell Station right on that corner. Oh, okay. But okay. so I re- when I actually heard about your shop, I was like, oh, you're like deep over there by like state you're like on almost on the other side right yeah base actually college is like just probably about quarter mile down the street okay or half mile down the street yep damn that's so sick <laughs> i have such good memories of being over by state yeah you get a lot of college kids we do yeah and this is the first full season they're back so it's looking looking good oh well dude that actually oh wow let's get right into that so when when covid hit you were already open right yeah, I opened in 2018, so I think we're open a year and a half. Year and a half. So you had a solid, you know, you had to get through that first six months, which business owners and which I'm, I'm going through currently <laughs> right now, but as business owners have told me, they were like that first six months is, it's tough. And then you get through it and then, you know, you make the year, you're at a year and a half, you're probably making good profits or at least getting known around the neighborhood, getting things on the positive and then COVID hits. How did you deal with that? Well, when COVID hit, like I was actually needing to get some more money for the shop. You know, I was at that point um, where I was like, okay, it's, you know, time to figure something out. So essentially I shut down for two weeks because my landlord suggested that I do. And then um, I opened back up and just worked every single day by myself for about a year to save on payroll. Um I reinvented like the menu, the pickup lines. I had like just pick up at the door. I delivered every single day in my van, coffee beans, growlers of cold brew. So I would work like seven to four. And then afterwards I would deliver all around San Diego. I built a website to to do online. I, I don't know how to do any of this, right? Like Dude, that's I'm, so dope. I'm old school. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like Instagram DM, but I just kind of learned. I did have some people help me out with some stuff, but I mean, I just hustled essentially I what can I do to break even today that's all I did and then eventually I got some help from SBA you know PPP loans and all that stuff damn dude that's so epic that's so dude you worked every day by yourself for a year about about yeah legend <laughs> like fucking legend dude no I'm doing the same thing right now um I do have a new employee that I just hired but it's just me mm-hmm. um I definitely it's interesting hiring a new employee that knows nothing. Oh, like, yeah. I've had employees here. Uh, 
you know, friends who have moved on and stuff, you know, no, nothing negative, but it's just like, they were already kind of like trained, Mm -hmm. you know, they kind of had a general idea of how to work behind a bar, bar flow, working in specialty coffee specifically. But now that I have uh, Natasha, shout out to Natasha, if you're listening, she's so, I guess, is it wet behind the ears? I guess that would be be a term like, or just green. She's Mm -hmm. green. You know, that's a better way to put Mm -hmm. it. She doesn't know anything in terms of, you know, dosing and, and weighing the shots. And then like when the shots coming out, like uh, ratios and all these things and I'm teaching her and it's like, I'm not saying this in a negative way. I'm saying it in like, wow, like I, I haven't had to train somebody like this. And then I'm also training her on roasting. That's originally why I I Mm -hmm. hired her to do it. So the bar is just like a, Hey, you might have a couple shifts here, but you should know. Uh, but the roasting aspect, I'm teaching her that. So it's like, she's getting a full course in specialty coffee And it's so interesting. Like I sit here and I'm just like, whoa, this, it takes me back because I do work every day by myself from seven to three or like, you know, to the, you know, seven to four, four 30, depending on cleaning. It's just like, it's really quite awesome to help somebody build like this new language, Mm -hmm. if you will, you know, because Mm -hmm. you have to speak the language of coffee to really understand it. Cause you could just like, that's what separates us from, um, you know, Starbucks, (laughs) I don't want to be negative, like a, <laughs> like a button pusher, you know, or something yeah, like no, that. For sure. You know, I don't mean to be negative, but that's like the best way to describe it. But it's like, that's what separates us. So it's, it's very exciting and it's very humbling, you know, in, in a way. But I do respect the, the working every day by yourself. I mean, dude, it's, it's a grind. And then also to try to have a life. Like, how do you, how do you find balance? Um, you know, what's funny is when I first opened my shop, I worked every, I had a business partner shortly, um, but I still worked every single day. And I, um, I'm one of those people that I was like, I'm never going to work harder for myself than I worked for somebody else. When I used to manage coffee shops, I'd be working 60 hours a week, but was, the pay wasn't matching up to that. Right. Yeah. And, but I learned so many valuable things, but I was like, you know, what? I don't want to burn myself out working for my own business. So when the opportunity came, when I was starting to have some time off, it was like, it's my shop's going to sink or swim with or without me being there every single day. And if it's good without me being there, then that means I'm doing a good job and I deserve the time off. I no longer believe that I need to work every single day and kill myself because if my shop can't survive without me, then it's not worth it. I mean, you, you have to build to that point, right? It's not like, I mean, I'm four and a half years in, so I just took my first three week vacation. So long as I've ever been away from my shop, but how I feel mentally and physically, spiritually, Mm -hmm. I'm ready to go. I could work every single day for a year if I needed to right now, because I refreshed myself and gave my, like allowed myself to give back to myself essentially. Well, you're also that, I mean, it goes back to our conversation before the podcast talking about reset, just like the reset that you need. You know, I, I feel like because in a really weird way, because of the fact that I have so many friends that are business owners in San Diego specifically, and because I've been doing the podcast for so long and I've had a chance to talk to everybody, I feel like I've taken like all these things from every single person and applied it to my business. And I'm like, I feel like I'm accelerating at a pace that's like almost unmanageable, not sustainable, but it's also... I've learned so many things from everyone who's been on this show that it's like, okay, I'm experiencing this. Boom. This is how you, you know, this is how you mm-hmm. boom, do this, do this, do this. Even talking to you right now, you've given me like a, a really interesting way. Uh, you just said my business is going to sink or swim without me there. I've never thought about it that way. Not once. And it's like, not in a bad way. I was just like, damn, there it is again. Another fucking, okay. Relax a little bit. You can chill, mm-hmm. you know, like, um, y- yesterday I had a day off because I actually didn't have to roast yesterday. I could have roasted in like for some of my accounts, but it's like, I have a new roaster. I'm going to just pile it on to Monday when she's here with me and we'll get it done. So it's like, I had a day to really relax and reset, but I was telling my friend, I was like, I don't even think I really like, you know, I, I don't like, it's like, let your shoulders like mm-hmm. kind of just chill. I I was like, it was like 11 o'clock at night. And I remember just sitting there and I was just like, Okay, I think I'm kind of good right now, but it mm-hmm. took all day to get to that point from the time I woke up until 1130 at night, right before to go to bed. It's like, dude, I don't even know, but 
you gave me a new way to think about something <laughs> <laughs> like for real. Um, so you worked every day for a year. You, you made it through COVID. Mm-hmm. What was, was there any point during COVID that like you had epiphanies to do new things? I mean, you said you redesigned the menu, but did you also start roasting during that time? Yeah. So I, I changed a lot. I, I, I changed my food menu essentially and I went all vegan with it. Cause it was just easier with the health inspector and with all of that. So I made like three new fresh foods, toast, whatever, put that out. Um, easy to make grab and go for people too. Um, something that was easy for myself and staff, which I brought once I brought staff back on. And then the five year plan was always to roast my own beans. Cause I'm like, it's not sustainable to buy beans from other businesses essentially. Mm-hmm. And I've always wanted to roast. That's what I've always wanted to do. I've worked in roastery. So I was at a point where it was like sink or swim at my shop. And I'm a person I'm all in. Let's go 100%. So I am already have a lot of debt building up from COVID. Like mm-hmm. I doubled my debt. So let me buy a roaster, right? So I got a loan for a, a San Franciscan and um, got an SF6. I knew I could put it in my shop and I didn't have to get, you know, all these different permits. I also knew it wasn't sustainable for me to drive to the roastery, um, with me working seven days a week at the time. So yeah, I had that, the roaster delivered, started roasting, kind of taught myself, had Tyler teach me a little bit. From Tired Eyes. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's, that's the homie. That's my friend. Yeah. I love Tyler. Shout Shout out out. Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out Tyler (laughs) Herrera. That's my G. Yeah. So I went up and and trained with him a little bit, but pretty much I self-taught. I really like to teach myself, learn everything. Um, and then what else did I, did I drink? I think during COVID, I started, you know, expanding my merch line. I started doing to-go bottles of 32-ounce drinks, stuff like that. Um, and like coffee? For cold brew, yeah. Like oh, wow. doing cold brew growlers, just stuff where people had at home for, you know, three, four days at a time so they don't have to come to the shop every single day. So setting them up with stuff like that. Um, and then, like I said, again, shipping online, that was getting a website going. So those are kind of how I pivoted where all of those things were before I was kind of, I'm old school, like specialty coffee sort of, but still that second wave where you want to come in, hang out, get the whole atmosphere. Yeah. Um, so it was a lot of learning and, a, but that's where I thrive. It was like sink or swim. So I have to get out of my comfort zone and try all these new things and everything's worked so far. We're still open. Dude, that says a lot about who you are as a person. Like if I knew nothing else about it, about you, if I found out that you under pressure, like gun to your head, you're able to figure out, pivot, do these things. You say in your old school, but yet you figured out a website, you figured out how to do things that go. You doing these things to pivot to, to help you survive. So it's like, in a way, you're not really old school. Like you're not old school. You just, you didn't need it. And now you, you, now, you know, Mm -hmm. and so now it's another thing, add it to your, your arsenal of like amazing attributes that you can just be like, I can pull from at any point. So it's like, dude, that's, I knew nothing else about you. All all I needed to hear was that it's like, (laughs) bro, fuck. Yeah, dude. Cause I, every day. And I mean, I know, you know, you have four and a half years on me. Like every day I think about something and then it's like, um, I guess the best way to put it was my friend Ray Ray said to me the other day, he's like, you know what I noticed about you, dude? He's like, you're very action oriented. And I was like, I've never heard that term before, to be honest. But when he said that, I was like, can you, can you explain that to me? He's like, you're the type of person that you see something it needs to get done. You're like, okay, we're going to do it right now. And we're going to do it fucking fast. Yes. Like, <laughs> but it all like, maybe not fast, but just get it done yeah. and get it done. Right. I don't know how to do it. We're going to figure it yeah, out. Absolutely. You know, and that sounds very much like, dude, I, I can respect that because when you see that in other people that, you know, it's like, it's like that term. I've said this the last couple of weeks on the podcast, but there was like Jerry Seinfeld and Chris Rock are having a conversation about skateboarders. And they're like, you know, when I see those kids, like they're going to, they're going to be all right. You know, cause then he starts talking about why he thinks this way because of the trying and the trying and the trying. And then eventually you get it. And that's how I feel like very successful business owners are just successful people in general. You're going to learn, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, you're going to fail your way to success and then you're going to get it done. Mm-hmm. What separates you from everybody else, in my opinion, is how how willing are you to take those L's? Are you willing to take those L's with like blood dripping from your knees, crying, but still grinding and trying to get it because you know eventually you're going to break through? Or are you like, I'm going to get to a certain point. I'm going to stop. I'm going to quit. 
maybe regroup a little bit and then come back. It's like, nah, son, like sink or swim, mm-hmm. right? Like, no, you're, you're, I feel like you're the type of person, Danny, just based on what you're saying that you're like broken arm, skinned up knee, <laughs> fucking, I, I don't have no money, but I'm going to still make this happen. You know, like a hundred percent, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yo, um, and that's also, I mean, just to, to kind of segue into this, like the reason I had you on the podcast is like, I feel like eventually you would have come on whether it was just me saying whatever, but I've been, I've been really saying on the Instagram and like, uh, sometimes on here is like, Hey, like if you have people like any of the listeners around the world, if you have a guest that is in the San Diego area, LA, or just relatively California, I can most likely make it happen to get the conversation going. But like, tell me who you want. Dude, I got a DM about you from Pablo. Oh, yeah, Pablo, Pablo was like, <laughs> yeah, shout out to Pablo. He's the fucking best. Uh, he, he, uh, just DM me. He's like, Hey, I really want to hear Danny's story. Like get her on the show. I was like, it's exactly right. I get people telling me about which skaters they want. All right, let's go. Like I'll get them on. So, I just wanted to let you know that like, dude, you were a direct request. Love I was that. like, dude, fucking <laughs> fuck. Yeah, let's go. Uh, so tell me, you said you've worked in roasteries, you've worked in coffee. Where was like your first job? Why did you want to work in coffee? And, uh, how long have you been in the industry? So coffee wise, I started at 21 years old at the living room in Point Loma. So this was 2005. Um, super old school. I walked in, I said, I need a job. They gave me one. Um, didn't know how to do anything and, um, ended up being the manager working there for, I think three or four years and YouTubing how to make coffee So uh, sick. with gre- with greasy espresso grinds. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. thought that was normal. Um, and then from there, Java Jones downtown in San Diego was a roastery. Okay. Um, it was kind of like Virtuoso when Virtuoso opened up and Cafe Calabria and Bird Rock kind of all opened around the same time roasteries. Really? 2009, I think. Um, it was around that era back okay. then. But um, I got into coffee, I said like when I was 12 living in Illinois, I'm going to move to California and work in coffee. I, I just like would go to the bookstores and there would be a Starbucks inside yeah. and um, – like, like at Barnes and Noble? Yeah, yeah, but when I was a teenager, you know, I'd get stoned and I'd go read books and then yeah. drink coffee till like midnight. And I thought like this is what I want to do. And this is when only second wave coffee shops were around. Yep. So I did that. I moved to California and then I got into coffee. I always wanted to own my own business. I'm rogue. Like I've never ever, I'm 37, ever worked for a corporation in my life. I've only ever worked for small businesses. I like you know, don't know that I could. It's, I like to do my own thing, you know? (laughs) Yo, same, same. I love that. So, um, yeah, so I worked for the living room, worked for Java Jones downtown, which is a roastery. Had a couple up in Santa Barbara too. I learned everything from him. I learned so many valuable, like the owner really took me under his wing. Um, and then I helped, um, someone else open up lazy hummingbird in ocean beach. We opened up Yo, on the corner, right across the street from the Buffalo, or like yeah. the Buffalo, but the wing place that's there yeah. now. Yeah, so it wasn't that back in the day. <laughs> yeah, we opened that, and uh, the the owner, she was looking for someone to help her open, and I had the experience, so um, we ended up opening three coffee shops, and oh. I worked there for seven years, and it was at the point where, like, for small businesses, you can only go so high, right? Like, mm-hmm. you can't, you can only pay an employee so much, manager so much, um, so I kind of ended up dissol- like deciding to move on, but I was going to maybe not do coffee anymore. Oh. And then the opportunity for my sh- shop opened. But um, so I guess when it comes to coffee, just something I it was always like sexy to me, right? Like yeah. I was like, ooh, making coffee sounds awesome. And I just did it, just made it happen. I wanted to do it. And then I always went to my own shop and just worked my way up. Um, and that's actually, I did apply for Starbucks once and they denied me and I'm so grateful. They didn't, didn't believe in me. Dude, same. <laughs> I mean, like I had not, <clears throat> they, I didn't even get a chance to finish the interview. I, uh, <laughs> I had just got my, I don't even know if it was, it was one of these two tattoos that I have on my forearm, but I literally like showed up with a short sleeve shirt on or maybe like a button up, but I like rolled it up. And I remember sitting there and I was so excited cause I was like, I'm going to finally work at Starbucks. Got my foot in the door. She somehow saw the tattoo 
and she stopped the interview. She's like, I'm sorry, we can't continue the interview. I said, why? She's like, because you have a tattoo on your forearm. She's like, we do not allow tattoos on our employees, which is like funny now because you go in and like everybody's tatted. But right. it's like, I just like, really? And my friend who had gotten me the job interview, he worked there. His name was Romeo. He had these plugs that were like, dude, they had to have been like more than a half dollar. <laughs> so it's like you can have plugs and like have your ear just hanging hella low, but you can't have like a forearm tattoo. Like this is ass backwards. I was just like. I mean, fuck Starbucks. I mean, yeah. I kept going, obviously, like afterwards, like to get coffee and stuff. But I was devastated. Mm-hmm. Like, dude, I want just like you. Coffee was so sexy to me. And I thought it was like, this is perfect. I developed a reputation working like as when I was a skateboarder, like that's what I was doing. It was like, yo, if we're on a skate trip, like don't even talk to console. Yeah, this coffee, you know, type <laughs> of thing. And I was like, find us coffee shops or find like a local one or whatever. Go to 7-Eleven. Who cares? Coffee was everything to me and uh man i would i would have to agree i'm glad they didn't hire me because it definitely kept the the vibe alive though right yeah yeah Yeah. i mean when i the first time i ever got a job at a coffee shop when i walked into zoom bar in cardiff all i knew i showed that i filled out the application and the dude was like that's how much you made at your last job i was like yeah he was like you're not gonna make that here i was like it's fine (laughs) like he's like we'll pay you 1250 plus tips i was like all right what am I going to do? He's like, you're going to wash dishes. I was like, fuck. Hell yeah. Dude, at 29, I was I like it. switching the it. fucking, uh, the, uh, the career, if you yeah, will. Yeah. Yeah. But how old were you when you got your first shop? I was 14. I grew up in the Midwest. So we no, had, when you got, when oh. you got your first shop, what, Altrea, when, how old were you? Oh, when I opened my shop, I was 33, 34, 33 or 34. I can't Dang. remember. <laughs> So you were working at Lazy Hummingbird well into your 30, like early 30s. Mm-hmm. I was, I think, 32 when I when I quit. Yeah, I was I was man, like um, opening the shop. So we, we had one and then I opened up the two other ones. So mm-hmm. I was definitely more of a management a salary role. OK, if you will. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When did you realize the difference between what you were doing and specialty coffee, like the craft aspect of it? Like, wh- when did I realize? Like, because if you're, if you're doing, like, lazy hummingbird and stuff, that's mm-hmm. more second wave, right? Yeah. For, yeah, for exactly. coffee people out there who don't know what we're talking about, yep. there's, like, a difference. But, like, we consider Starbucks second wave, and then specialty coffee is essentially, if you're in North Park, San Diego, it's a very, very nice area where, like, people are weighing out their shots. They're weighing out their grams. There's, like, attention to detail with the coffee, and it's not, like, uh, over-roasted. There's a lot of attention and detail to it. That's, like, third wave, right? White walls, <laughs> white countertops, you know, you know, you've been there, guys. But um, like I, I would imagine in that time you were also seeing like maybe the what was like the Thursday throwdowns, latte art. Yeah, throwdowns. yeah. So that's what I mean is like when did gotcha. you see that difference like between the second wave and the third wave? Because it must yeah. have happened while you were opening those. Campaigns. It was I think it was 2009. And I remember Coffee and Tea Collective opened and mm-hmm. then shortly after Dark Horse opened. But I already was going to Seattle and Portland oh. on my own doing coffee trips because I was like, this is not it. Like I was already on like YouTube or Instagram seeing like third wave coffee and being like, how can I be, what the hell is a pour over? What's, uh, okay, uh, yeah. what is, how do you roast coffee? Right. So Java Jones before lazy hummingbird, they were kind of on the edge of third wave. So I didn't know all about it, but at lazy hummingbird, I would beg to do some third wave stuff. So I started getting in like at the time, I guess, dark horse and coffee and tea trying zoom bar too. And yeah, yeah, getting, yeah. Uh, I built my own, I got out like all my tools and built a pour over stand and I was trying to convince the owner, like, look, this is it. So on the weekends I would work the pour over station Sick. and then we had a Kyoto cold brew tower and I would feature uh, different roasters as well. Um, oh, so yeah, you knew, I knew, knew and I had a beg, but like it just the owner didn't line up with what she necessarily wanted to do. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it was a constant frustration that I had to just like realize I'm, you know, until I opened my own shop, this is who I'm working for, yeah. which, which was fine. But, um, you know, so I think I, I've known about it for a long time, but I was trying to make it happen and, you know, it wasn't happening. <laughs> 
it was something I kept to myself at home in my own home bar, you know, like. But you were just like low key obsessed with obsessed, obsessed, obsessed. Like any time I was going off, I was going to any single coffee shop. I would drive to L.A. on my days off and go to at the time like uh, I don't know Verve and you know all those different places. Just like yeah, like Stumptown or some shit. Like yes, that. yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. So I'm like trying to think what was popular back then, but. Dude, yeah, no. <laughs> Dude, I remember going to L.A. for, like, some coffee fest, like, maybe within the last five years. And I remember going to uh, Dayglo. Mm-hmm. I love Dayglo. Dude, yeah. I was, like, I, I was, like, what's the hype? You know, like, what is this? Like, I'm searching coffee spots and stuff and just checking out things like that. And it's, like, dude, they're doing it right, too. You know, it's super cool to, to go. And that's, what, dude, it's, like, skateboarding. I've, I don't know if I've said this on the podcast before, but, it's like, or I had to, I've had to. But coffee and skateboarding, there's so many parallels in the way where it's, like, I lived in France and like when I was there, I heard, the first time I heard English in the part of, uh, I lived in Aix-en-Provence, so it's like deep. There's not, there's not a lot of people speaking English there, but like w- the first time I heard English was because of skateboarding. They were like, oh, like skateboard, like kickflip, kickflip, you know, or something like that. So it's like, oh, they, but they didn't speak English, but it's like coffee. It's the same thing. I went to Seoul, South Korea and I went into the coffee shop and there's nobody there who speaks English. You speak English and they're like, what the fuck are you saying? Like, same thing. But you look at the menu and there's all the coffee drinks, but they're like in English. Or if you're talking to the 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 barista, they'll know cappuccino, americano, like all these things. But they don't know any other English. So you're just like, you know, americano. And then they give it to you like, come sahamida, you know, or something like that. Like, it's super crazy. And I always trip out wherever I was in the world. If I Even if I didn't speak the language, all you have to do is go to a coffee house yeah. and like, somewhat understand what the, that language so it's like yo this is so fucking dope dude like <laughs> for sure i love it it's so sick i mean but that's just a whatever either way um so you you get into this you start opening the cafe you have a five-year plan you start roasting you learn from tra- uh, tyler you're doing your own thing what was it like learning to roast all, I mean, like you took a, like a class or something, right? A consulting session with Tyler, right? You, you take away from that. How many did you have of those? Just one? I think, I think two or three. Two or three? Yeah. And then, then you're just off to the races on your own. Yes. What was, what was it like for you to uncrate your roaster? Did you know that you had to season it? I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was it like uncrating it and, uh, and then, you know, taking that first leap, even just to season it. I've had a little bit of a, like, what is it like? Uh, I don't want to say nightmarish, but I, I don't have, you know, natural gas at my coffee shop. So it's propane. propane. (laughs) Dude, we talked about this at the roast thing. And I was like, I don't know anything about that. Yeah. So I uncreated this and I was like, cool, this is going to be quick and easy. I just need to get the propane hooked up and then get um, the, why am, why am I blinking? Uh, the pipes, you know, like the exhaust. Yeah, the back flue, yeah, the, the exhaust, yeah, yeah. whatever. So I just need to get that hooked up and then we'll be good to go. As soon as I get it, like we, you know, a part was missing, this and that. So it took a while. So we get it all up and then um, I have, the electrical people come out and they tune it up, t- tune it into the propane and then I season it, which was terrifying. So I'm like, I'm going to light my whole shop on fire. Yeah. I'm going to like, you know, it's smoking and I'm like, I'm by myself. Like I realize, like, do I, you know, I have a fire extinguisher. It's broken. Like what, you know, like, dude. is this safe? Like this feels so terrifying. Dude. Yeah. And propane. It's like, talk about natural. You're worried about natural gas lines yeah. exploding. You have a propane, which yes. is like, it's essentially like, uh, for lack of a better term, like a little bomb. Yes, yeah. definitely. So, um, yeah. And actually I feel like the first couple of roasts I did, like they turned out super good. You know, really? I was like, wow, this is, you know, I think you're just proud of yourself. You're like, wow, this is awesome. I'm fucking doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've had a lot of challenges with the propane, like the seasons, right? Like in the winter, it's totally been different. Um, that makes in the sense. summer it's different. So like the gas on it um, fluctuates a lot learning. I just now had an airflow problem. So in what way? Um, something was clogged essentially on the machine, like just cleaning it. Right. So I had to take the whole entire thing apart yeah. and I'm like, I like I'm a mechanic now. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah. And this dude. thing's pretty heavy. Like 
I'm, you know, on a ladder doing it. And then, you know, it starts up like a charm. So, Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, roasting, it's like, I learned from Tyler, but at the same time with the propane, he even had challenging time. Uh, yeah teaching me because he's like I don't know you know and so I'm also using artisan because I'm financially you know not there with the other um the apps you know what I mean paying paying for the apps um so I feel like I'm on my own right and then now it's like tuning up I feel I always relate it to I used to bicycle all times like when you have your bike and it's yours and you know exactly how to ride it and use it and it's fitted exactly to you That's how I feel like it is with my sheen. I know if one little thing is off, I know how to adjust the propane exactly. I mean, I still run into challenges, right? Like trying to diagnose like the airflow problem. Where is it coming from without having to take my whole entire machine apart? Yeah. Um, I think not a lot of roasters maybe who share roasting equipment necessarily know how to take a whole entire roaster apart and do all that. So I'm like, how, who do I reach out to? You know, San Franciscan, it's, they're not here, right? They're yeah. They can help you to a certain. They can point. help me to a certain point. So, yeah. it's a challenge, right? So sometimes I feel like things turn out a little roastier than I want, but I still have to put the coffee out, right? Because I'm not at a place to just be tossing every little thing. That's not you know what I think. Like is perfect out, you know. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think what keeps me going is like customers coming back and buying the beans, being on subscriptions and telling me they really like the coffee or they see the improvement in it. And Oh, that's dope. They you give know, you feedback like that? Yeah. Roasting, wow. And roasting for my customer base. You know, I used to mm. think I need to roast light and it needs to taste like blueberry syrup and this and that. And yeah. now I roast for like, I talk to my regulars like, hey, what do you like? What profiles do you like? Do you like this Honduras? Do you like that? Do you, you know, like the medium roast and, you know, they're buying it. So that's... That's who I roast for, essentially. And well, that's the smartest way to do it, anyways. They're yeah. the people who are coming to your shop who are supporting you every single day. So it's like, yo, come on now. Yeah, it's yeah. like you know, dark roast is like banned from San Diego for a long time, bro. And, <laughs> and now it's like you see people like, oh, we have a dark roast, uh, you know, that we're selling now, or they're launching dark roast because I think the people are starting to speak up. You know, like maybe you Dude, want something a little darker. That's what I'm. <laughs> <laughs> fucking say it louder for the people in the back. Yo, like that's what I'm saying. Cause like I have my light roast. Like I have four coffees that I'm on set letter in rotation right now. Mm-hmm. My Issa blend, notorious El Cajon Boulevard and the Bendishones. Bendishones is a medium roast. Issa blend is my espresso blend. And then I have notorious, which is a light to medium. And then El Cajon, which is my lightest. Mm-hmm. My, it, my house espresso blend is 100% different from everybody in North park. And I only say that because everybody's still on that. Latin, African, I need a little bit of body and I need some acidity. I need some sweetness. And I'm not saying it's bad because I still love it. Like I go to Hawthorne and they do that and I fucking love their cappuccinos. Like, you yeah, know, I, these are my homies anyways. Everybody here for the most part, I fuck with everybody. But when I was like, yo, if I'm already coming into a saturated market, I got to do what I like mm-hmm. because I'm doing the represent representation like of myself yes. with everything in here. So it's like mine is um, a darker roast. There's no acidity to it. It's, uh, a Brazilian Indonesian blend. <clears throat> it's smoky. It's chocolatey. It's not smoky. It's chocolatey. It's bold, and it has just a little bit of like, a, like a je ne sais quoi. But like, it's like it just has that, and it's like that's where the Indonesian comes in. It just mm-hmm. gives you like that little bite, a little punch. Yes. And I think you can do spe- you can do that in specialty coffee and not make it taste like what I call nostalgic coffee, mm-hmm. which is just over roasted nobody gives a fuck it's piercing diner coffee yeah yeah i mean that you know or some people be like oh this tastes like starbucks it's like okay sure yeah, yeah. but it's like again bringing it back at the starbucks again it was like yo like we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for starbucks like totally you Absolutely. know when people are like i hate starbucks but it's like i remember the My barnes and noble yeah. yeah like the barnes and i would think it was so <laughs> sick to like Go get whatever drink in the in the in the Starbucks and like walk yes. into the Barnes and Noble and I go to the mag section because that's where they had all the new Escape magazines. Yes, Thrasher, yes. Trans World, whatever. And I would just sit there with the coffee and my dad loved it. He'd go off and go read books and like be, do a bunch of shit, art books, whatever. But I would just sit there looking at Escape mags and drinking coffee. Hell like, yeah, you know. So it's I don't I don't really hate Starbucks. No, it's the '90s. Like if you were a '90s kid, mm-hmm. I feel like that that's nostalgia like that's what there was to do you know what i mean exactly so dude couldn't agree more (laughs) uh so 
while we were talking about the propane thing, for me, as like my roaster mind, I definitely think like, I definitely understand, you know, when it's in the colder months and then it's also in the hotter months, just that affects your beans. Mm -hmm. I mean, because the beans, most people don't know is that they have like, you know, anywhere between 11 to 13% water still left in the bean, which is why you're roasting that out. That being said, when you said about the propane, I mean, it's gas. Your, the gas is going to fluctuate depending on the on the weather. So are you going through, when you're finding it's hot, I mean, I'm sure that gas is thinning out, so you're flying through roast even quicker than you would in, in the yeah. winter. Yeah. Because in the winter, it's going to burn slower because it's more it's uh, more condensed. Yeah. yeah. When definitely doing more like eight, nine minutes um, in the summertime and then like, you know, around 11 in the winter, I would say. That's still depending. solid though. That's like yeah. right, right Try, up there. Trying to it. hit the targets. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I've got it kind of dialed in. On um, this last heat wave we had, though, I was coming in four in the morning and roasting till about nine because it was only time that it was cool. Yeah, I mean the back room is so hot, even with the air on. Like you have to have, I have to have my doors cracked, you know, in the Jesus. roasting room. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I was like, you know, roasting all this coffee before my trip and hundred degree weather and trying to figure it out, and then make, you know, it's just you hope it turns out good. I mean, yeah. I have it down enough to where I think, it, you know, it's not like burnt or underdeveloped, but it's not tasting grassy or burnt. And I'm like, okay, like it's drinkable and it tastes good. Yeah. And you know, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. So, and, and at my type of coffee shop, like we're more of a, um, with milk type of shop, right? Most people are getting their espresso with milk drinks. So you can, I guess hide the imperfections a little bit more. We do sell drip and Americanos, but not as much as we're selling lavender lattes. Okay. That makes a little bit more mm -hmm. sense. Okay. Interesting. Hmm. I never thought about it that way. We do sell a lot of co black cold brew. Like that's kind of more like if I, what I'm known for, for anything like a black coffee, people really like our cold brew. Sick. Yeah. Dude, that's dope. Um, so, What's been your hardest challenge being a roaster other than it being propane? Like green buying, would it be like coming up with different profiles? Would it be just general, like the cleaning of the roaster? I mean, because the, the, when you said about the roaster thing, that was very interesting because when I first started Caffeine and Green, my first, I want to say like two or three jobs were just cleaning people's roasters wow. and educating them on how to take them apart and to clean them adequately. Yep. first three paid jobs I dude, I did it for wholesome amazing uh, salty yeah like I showed her how to take her IR5 because like I've I've been lucky enough to really work on multiple roasters That's from awesome. like Probat to Dietrich to uh, San Franciscan you know a bunch of different roasters so I know how to take them apart and to do that and I, I love how you pointed that out like you could share a roaster at the collective but not every everybody knows what it goes into taking care of roasters mm -hmm. and it's Dude, that was like my bitch work at Zoom Bar. Yeah. Every fucking week, they made me clean the roaster, like deep clean the roaster. That was my job. Yeah, you're working harder, right? Because you're roasting and cleaning and packaging. Oh, yeah. And people, not not saying there's anything wrong with that, but once you know your roaster and know what you're doing, I mean, you have to, especially um, SF6, you're cleaning it way more often. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. in between, you're roasting a lot more coffee to get to what you need. And well, dude, you're using, but like, this is goes back to what you were saying. Like you're, what did you say? You're like a mechanic now, but it's <laughs> like, dude, the small intricacies of learning how to clean a roaster, getting three M tape. So you could fucking seal up those little gaps with the SF6 with that back. Flip. Yes. Like, dude, oh my gosh. that's a gnarly thing you got to do. And then especially with the SF6, you have a chaff chamber. You might not be burnt like an afterburner, but you have a chaff chamber that is very, very small. So you're gonna have to get something that's going to be able to get in there, get all the chaff out. And then it's like taking that apart air filters. Uh, do you have a inlet and an outlet manifold in yours for the electrical? Uh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That one right there was a big challenge for me on the SF25 when I had to like undo the electrical for that. I didn't even fucking know what that was. The electrical, like P SDG &E had to come out. They're like, all right, this is what this is. This is what it is. It's like there's certain things like they give you your, you know, manual, if you will. But there's still things that aren't even covered in the manual that like yeah. only electricians will know. Dude, a month into having it, I was deep cleaning it and the, the fan on top mm -hmm. of the SF6. I took it apart. I didn't realize like how it was attached, you know, and the whole electrical unit fell on the ground, ripped apart. And then now I'm an electrician because I'm rewiring because San Francisco, no. it's like days are not getting a hold of me. And I'm like, 
I don't even know who to call. There's two white wires, two black wires. Like, you know, so I attached it and it was going the wrong way the first time. So then oh, I no. rewired it the other way, <laughs> you know, cause it was blowing smoke in the wrong way. And I realized like, oh, my God. you know, so I'm like, it's trial and error, but I'm so happy. I know all these things Yeah. because it, it makes you, I think respect your, your roasting. It makes me feel more proud of myself. I guess that like, I'm actually doing it, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm hands on and, um, that's the type of person I want to know the ins and out of everything that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, especially before I bring somebody on at my own shop, because like, if anyone's going to set my roaster on fire, it's going to be me, not a staff <laughs> member. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But yeah, I think the toughest thing being a roaster is imposter syndrome because mm. there's so many good roasters in San Diego or like the respect yeah. among roasters or like if you're really well known, whether people think your coffee is good or, you know, like I guess like what it is is I'm so micro I'm a micro coffee shop. Not that many people know that we roast that we're around enough people, well, but it's, it's relatively new though. Yeah. Like, yeah. so, I mean, give it, give it some time, totally, you totally. know, give yourself some more credit. Yeah. 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 So I think, but I think that's what it is. Is like, yeah, I'm roasting, but it's like, sometimes I feel like embarrassed or like, I, maybe I don't know what I'm doing, which is not true, but just in general, I think, um, you know, comparison is a thief of joy and I've had a lot of hard times during COVID, like comparing myself to other coffee shops, other business owners, social media is a bitch. Cause just cause someone mm -hmm. has like way more likes doesn't mean that they're necessarily busier, better. I think like my coffee's good. And, but it's like, I don't know if it's good. Right. Cause it's like, who's really telling me if it's good or not, you mm -hmm. know, like in that sense. Cause like you want honest feedback, I guess is what it is. But, um, but what keeps me going with that is my customers, like our reviews on Yelp and Google and the people who come in and say, your coffee is so good, or I really like your coffee. And they sometimes even if they compare it to someone else, like in like, hey, I like your coffee better than so and so, like yeah. not in like a whatever way, but I'm just like, that makes me so happy. And I feel like these people have good taste too. It's not like they're comparing it to Starbucks, you know? There you go. So. I realize like I'm doing it for my customer base and that's it. I'm not doing it for every other coffee shop or barista in San Diego. I'm doing it for the people who support, you know, f who, who pay money to come to my shop, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I'm super glad you said that because I mean, dude, that's, I think that's the one thing I have like in myself that I've always kind of been that way in life, whether it was skateboarding and just anything I've ever done. But that's the one thing I've never had a problem with in terms of like, dude, who gives a fuck what anybody else thinks? Like, if you think your shit's tight, if it tastes good, you're fucking with it. It's just going to take some time, but people will catch on to your vibe and they'll do it. It's like, dude, yeah. that's the one thing I think I, I definitely like, yo, I respect everybody in like what they're doing. Unless you give me a reason not to respect you, then like, yeah, you're going to get the respect from jump. It's like saying when like, I'll trust you until you give me a reason not to. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that to me is like, why am I going to like my whole thought process is like, why would I ever shit on anybody who's doing something? Yeah. No, nah, bro. Cause I'm doing something and I know how fucking hard it is. So we might be different, but we are the same. Yes. You know what yes. I'm saying? Yeah, like definitely. you are going through exactly what I'm going through and you might be more seasoned or you might be even new to the game. Yes. But you know, and you know how hard it is. So it's like, if you really want to go out of your way to say like, fuck that person or like whatever they're doing is whack. It's like, what benefit does that bring to you? And how much energy are you wasting from that? Because honestly, you're in your own lane. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I feel like, like all the small business owners, like especially coffee, it's like, why compare to each other and not cheer each other on? Because like, we're not, we're up against convenient drive throughs right? Where people conveniently are just driving through big business places when we're kind of in it together we know the struggle especially if you're a hands-on business owner right mm -hmm. like in the coffee industry like you've opened your shop you've hired the employees you're training them you're roasting you're doing this that and the other you're the face of the company like i don't think anyone's trying to you know uh, like i i feel like there's a lot of support in san diego with that but then you know sometimes it's like there's no need to compare right like we're no one's trying to be in each other's lanes as far as I know. And like, I love all the shops here and I wish I didn't work all the time and I could go visit them more, you know? Dude, hundred percent. Like, so. I think I couldn't agree more. I mean, 
Dude, if if Nipsey Hussle said this, he said com- like creativity is the um, like you can't have comparison and creativity. You're gonna have one or the other. But you're gonna if you're gonna compare yourself or worry about what everybody else is doing, it robs you of your creativity yes. in the thing that you can produce on your own. He's like, he said Rick Ross told him that you know he wants every single penny that's his. Not a, not a cent more, not a penny less. Everything that's mine. And he's like, if I'm going to create something, I can only create that song. I can do it the way I can do it. Nobody else is going to be able to do it the way I do it. If you, me and you got the same coffee, me and you are going to roast completely yeah, different coffees. Definitely. And they're going to, they might maybe have an underlining taste, but like your touch and your feel and your roaster is going to be completely from my touch and my feel and my roaster. Same coffee. And it could be completely different ends of the spectrum. Totally. And it's like. Dude, I am. It's the own lane. Stay in your fucking lane. Everybody else, cool. Let's go. Let's get this. Because at the same time, it's like, to your point about the um, big business coffee, like, dude, the one thing I, can, I hear all the time, I got it today. It's like, why is this drink so expensive? <laughs> it's like, yo, because I, and I was super nice about it. I was like, because you got this, that was an extra charge because I pay for that. This one, I made this and I paid for it. So then that's part of that. And then here's your alternative milk. And that's the, all this costs money, G. I was like, especially in this area, it's like my prices are honestly evenly matched with everybody yeah. around here because I don't want it to be like, oh, I'm the expensive shop. Yeah. It's just everybody knows what it is. And then if we're roasting our coffee, it's priced moderate, like accordingly. If you want, you know, a $14, maybe even cheaper Ethiopian coffee. Yeah, you can get that at Starbucks and you can get like these like cheaper versions but what are you getting you're getting more sugar you're getting all of or like not attention to detail like you know what i'm saying like you're getting you're not getting what you would get here and there's a reason why we do what we do and people people don't know basic economics if you're a small business you're buying less right you're not buying 18 pallets of oat milk that is going to bring it down to two dollars of oat milk right you're buying (laughs) enough for the week or so because you're a small business you you only have so much storage you much have so much money so like you know, all that stuff is higher than yeah. when big businesses are pretty similar in prices, but their profit margins are at like 80% where ours are at, you know, maybe 30%. If that, you know, if that, if that, so, and yeah, don't even, I, I like, we, I get this all the time and I'm like, I'm the cheapest in my area, but okay. Yes. Too expensive. Yeah, and the same thing. It's like, I, I ask them, but people, what, what makes it all worth it in my opinion is when you have your regulars who buy those, you know, I was just talking about this earlier today, actually. It's like this one guy comes in. He only comes in maybe – actually, kind of, come, kind of comes in a lot. It's like every – I would say like every two, three weeks, every time he comes in, two bags of coffee. Nice. It's like – and he doesn't buy like an $18 bag. He buys a $20 bag. Hell he buys yeah. a 21 or a $22 bag. And it's like those two purchases right there help you – boom. Absolutely. One transaction d- – how many drinks would you need to sell just to get exactly. those profit margins on those two bags of coffee? Yep. And it's like – I don't mean to, to be a person who's talking about money or make it about that, but it's like you to do what you need to lo- to do what you love. You need to do what you need to do to keep that going. Absolutely. With moderately priced, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And not being greedy, not being too cheap, because if you give it to people too cheap, yep. then they're going to get pissed off that it's like, well, it used to be this. Now it's this. It's like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Definitely. It's it's definitely a fine line. But the people who appreciate it do and they'll support you. They're loyal as hell. You know what yeah. I mean? Like there's no going to Starbucks for them. They're like mm-hmm. you have to pry out of their dead cold hand a special local coffee shop. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I love the <laughs> I love on like Google and uh, like Yelp when you get a comment that's like I will no longer be going to Starbucks. Yes. yes, yes. Or this is so much better than Starbucks, you know, yeah, or something like yeah. that. It's It's very how do I say it? it's um I was gonna say like that's not the right word it's just it's like heartfelt but it's also like very like how do you I don't I, or it's just it's just heartfelt it's nice and they're like they really want to like they think they're standing out by yeah, saying yeah. that but it's like kind of everybody kind of says it so it's like it's cool like it is, I fuck yeah. with it tough yeah. like hey I appreciate you. Yeah, you know, they're, kind of they're, mo- they're like, you know, not doing convenience. Like they have to actually, you know, find a parking spot, get out of their car mm-hmm. and walk in and order, yep. you know. So that's that's awesome. Dude, I, I've i started to uh, 
realized, especially, and I think another reason I wanted to, another reason I wanted to have you on is that I've been going to coffee shops on Mondays, like on my day that I'm closed here to do roasting or whatever, but, uh, I try to make sure that either it's before roasting or after roasting, I will go to a coffee shop that I don't normally get to go to. And without fail over like the last month and a half, people I'll go into a coffee shop and they're like, you're caffeine and green. Like, Hell yeah. like, yo, I listen to your podcast or I'm listening to this podcast right now And the coffee podcast. I mean, it's, you know, know your demographic, right? Know your, know your people. And, uh, it's been taking off here more and more. So I was like, dude, having you on was just adding another, like, it's like, dude, fuck. Yeah. This is going to keep like the coffee community strong Sweet. and like more, um, accessible because some people like I have a, uh, I have a re- I guess he's not a regular, but he's, he's like a, a, a younger gentleman who comes in on the regular and he loves to talk to me about coffee and he just got hired at Starbucks and he's like, it is not anything I thought it was going to be. <laughs> And it, they don't care about the coffee and this and that. I'm like, yeah, dude, Like, <laughs> I could have told you that, you know, but then also like much like yourself when you're describing your hustle and working on these things, he's like, well, wh- what would it be like to work for me? I'm like, dude, I work for me. And I was like, I'm gonna tell you right now, you're going to work for me. You're going to grind. Yeah. You're going to grind hard because I'm running a roasting business as opposed to just like a, a cafe. Our focus is production and wholesale and doing these things and supplying multiple cafes, not just my own. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you're going to work here, bro. You're going to, you're going to grind. You're going to work in production. You're going to sweat. You're going to maybe learn roasting. A barista chef will be like a bonus. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, but that's why, that's why I fucking love this. It's (laughs) so sick, dude. And then you like, you go and like, you go to Calabria right down here and they have their huge roaster or you go to like Hawthorne and they got their whole operation going and it's, they know. And when you know that somebody knows like how hard it is, but they're doing it too. It's like, yeah, I, I see you G like, fuck. Yeah. Definitely. Like, super dope. You know, <laughs> what's, um, what's your biggest motivation in what was your, or I guess I should say, what was your biggest motivation in opening a coffee shop? I think for me, it was, uh, bridging like community and coffee together. Like, you know, it's like that basic, uh, everyone says coffee and community, but in like my previous 14 years of being coffee it was like i saw uh people go on first dates get engaged like open mics um people perform their poems music um getting hired right like i saw all this magic happen in coffee shops where it's like where else do you you're not seeing that at a bar you know um and then also an opportunity for my creativity because i love like I love specialty drinks. Like, I like specialty coffee, but I love um, experimenting with um, different ingredients to blend in with coffee or different things, make them come together. I'm super into that. I love traveling around the world and getting inspired, you know, by what I eat and drink over there and and bringing it back and putting it in my drinks and food. So I wanted to, like, bring something different, you know, to my shop and – also just like yeah doing whatever the fuck I want with my space like decorating I don't know it's just like something super cool right so my motivation really is to like I want people to feel at home I want people to come hang out I want people to feel safe and um I think there's a lot of people who maybe don't have family don't have friends but at a coffee shop if you're bris- your brisa you get to make or break someone's day right like they can come in in a bad mood you can leave them out the door with a with a, with a smile because you're like hey, Sophie, whatever their name is, here's your vanilla latte. And it's like someone remembered them. And I feel like that's like something special that we get to do because there's a lot of people who don't feel seen, heard, and loved in this world. And at coffee shops, we have that ability to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think like that was kind of like my heart behind that was like we get get to just like love people truly, you know, and not in like a weird way. No, no, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah, just like the world is messed up. And like, I always just loved hanging out at coffee shops. I mean, I felt loved and seen and whatever, but I just like to go to go into my local coffee shop and and feel that and Mm. to to be able to one like dealing that out and genuinely doing that. And then also, you know, giving um, a job to people who want to work in specialty coffee and are just in coffee. And it's hard to get jobs or maybe there's not a place that you really align with so I feel like all my employees like align with my vision you know or have some haven't you know definitely so I don't know being being the boss that I never got you know I never 
and I've definitely had a lot of mistakes being a boss, but I've never had, I feel like someone truly care about me the way I truly care about my staff. And, I, and I'm learning a lot about being a better boss and learning how to do that, but uh, having boundaries. <laughs> Um, yeah boundaries is a big one but yeah I guess that's my inspiration is just like um being able to provide things that I feel like uh aren't provided damn that's dope what is the theme of your cafe for people like describe it so people who haven't been there or you know would like would like to visit what what can they expect it's kind of like a DIY trippy hippie yet kind of like down-to-earth shop so um I think when you walk in, it, people, it feels cozy and it feels unique and cool. So we have like a wall of tarot cards and then we, oh. yeah, it's pretty sick. Um, I paint a different color wall every year. I do the Pantone color of the year. So we're ever changing, right? With the vibe, like nothing ever stays the same. Everything's in constant motion of changing. So like whenever I feel inspired, I change stuff up at the shop. So like good for like all of the white walls and plants. Love that for coffee shops. Yep. But like I want it to change with like the customers, with the staff, with like how I'm feeling and having that reflect. And I think that's what really draws in like our unique customers that we have. Dude, I like that. I'm glad you said that because I was actually like and I love everybody who's on the walls. If you guys are listening, but like I was talking, I was talking to one of my friends. I was like, you know what? Like, I think I want to like take these photos down and like put some new ones up. They're like, you're going to take those down. <laughs> and I was like, I don't mean it in a negative way. I mean it like I would, I love these photos, but I have so many more photos of them and other people that are on like, whether it's the skate team or the fight team or podcast guests, I love to highlight everybody because that's what got me to where I'm at. Oh, yeah. And like you, I want to change things up. Like I don't, that's why the cafe is the way it is. Like I, I was like, there's nobody in Southern California who's doing a hip hop themed yeah, cafe yeah, yeah, for sure. or even have any of the things that I have. So it's like, dude, yeah. Like keep it fresh. Let's keep it fresh. Let's keep it rotating. And then everybody I've said that to, they're like, nah, they're like, you got to <laughs> keep it the same. And I'm like, but why, you yeah. know? And then hearing you say that, I'm just like, oh, well, there you go. I mean, cause I think that's, even more dope. I mean, that keep a couple things that people can feel comfortable yes, with. Yes, yes. You know, the staples. The staples, yep. But things that can be easily changed out and give somebody a little bit more shine or give, just highlight other things to, to switch it up to make people like, yo, did you see it when it was this? Or like, oh, I went there when it was this. You know, it's yeah. like, it's different. And it, and it gives you that sense of like, oh, well, you missed it while it was there. Maybe totally. you should have gone there when it was that one, you <laughs> totally, know? Like, yeah. oh, I loved it when it was that color Pantone. And then you walk in, you're like, it's not the same. Yeah, like, totally. It's like, well, fuck, you should have got here, dude. That, you slip in. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So I feel that. <laughs> I love that. I love that you said that. Um, what do you think right now, you know, having gone through these definitely peaks and valleys with Altrea, where do you think you see your, what's like, what do you think the next chapter is? Or what do you want from it? I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, I'm not going to lie, like 15 years behind the floor, I'm, I'm getting burnt out, you know, um, of the, of the cafe, but like, I, I want, I'm, I'm figuring that out, right? Like I'm really meditating on it. What do I want? What do I want to do? Um, but roasting is a big part of it. I would love to expand and have, have my beans in grocery stores and have it more available, um, online. Um, you know, with the prices in San Diego, I do, uh, to be honest, I t I'm very transparent. Like, I don't know what that looks like um, with our leases and the cost of different things. So I'm trying to be very realistic about the future of Altrea and what that looks like. So I know roasting is a huge part of it. Um, and right now I'm kind of just like going with the flow and trying to make a profit and pay off some of the COVID debt. Yeah. Um, I tried to future trip because I, I started getting scared, like, you know. Um, but yeah, the future is definitely is, is the beans. Like I live in my van. Um, I've lived in my van for three and a half years. And a lot of it is um, because COVID was so difficult financially. And but I love it. So I travel a lot in my van. And I have like the little steeped coffee packets. And like, I would love to be able to get those into national parks and on a bigger scale like that. Um, I have a lot of friends in van. I'm like, I'm pretty into the van life circle, like all over the world. So I'm trying to integrate that part of the coffee bean. So like travel's huge for me. 
So I'm trying to figure all of that end of the things out, if that makes sense. Dude, yeah. Why not? <laughs> Fucking get that niche, corner that market, do your thing. I mean, that's, I was actually, that was going to be the next thing I was going to get into. Because uh, I think Pablo had mentioned that when he was like, hey, like I wanted to have her, I should have her on. She does this van life thing on top of roasting. So like what, I know what van life is, but first for anybody who doesn't know what it is, explain what it is. I think it's basically an alternative way of living. Some people are forced into it for financial reasons and some people choose to do it. So a lot of people who you basically live in a van, right? That's built out. You have like Like a a sprinter van, a sprinter van, or like my girlfriend has a 99 Ford Econoline, but it's built out. It's super like 70 style in there. Super cool. Um, but yeah, it's just a like built out van. You have a toilet. Uh, you, I have a gym membership to go shower. Um, uh, I cook in there. So it's basically a simple way of living, but it gives you a lot more freedom to to travel when you want. Um, a lot of, I guess they call digital nomads, right? People who are what, like uh, tech people. They can, you know, go work from wherever they have, you know, Wi-Fi. Um, so I think it's, I mean, it's a huge, massive movement. A lot of people are doing it. I got into it three and a half years ago for fun. Um, my lease was up and I was like, I've always wanted to do van life. And I, I built it out myself with my stepdad and then COVID hit. And I was like, thank God I do not have to pay rent and keep my shop open. So I love it. I do. You know what I mean? But I will tell you, like, it's extremely difficult to, own a business, roast coffee, and then do that on top of it. It's, it gets exhausting. Yeah. Um, but it's not more exhausting than paying these rents that we have in San Diego. <laughs> yeah, dude, I can imagine. So it's like, what's the hustle? Like, it, it allows me to have t- a couple days off a week or three days. You know what I'm saying? Which is good for my mental health. So it keeps m- the shop going, too. Nice. Yeah. Dude, well, if there's a will, there's a way. I mean, like, you found a way to make it work for you. Yeah. Why? What was your attraction to it? I think I've all like I've always worked two jobs and then hustled on the side like dog sitting or whatever so I could go on vacations like um, one time I lived in an apartment and I worked two jobs and then I quit both of the jobs put everything into my car and then I went to Bali for a month and, you know what I mean I like use uh, and I was like I'll figure it out when I'm back and then um, when I came back I got a Honda Element and got my job back and then like house sat and lived in my element and I was like wow this is really cool I'm like rewilding myself like I'm out in nature I go to Joshua Tree every Monday Tuesday to have off work I go to Idlewild um and it just gave me a reset and then it financially was like a little bit better you know to to do that I think I think you know allows you to like like as a business owner, it's like, how do you pay yourself? Like, what do you pay yourself? All of that. But like mm-hmm. living in the van, it helps me keep it, a, you know, keep the shop afloat a little bit easier. So like by any means necessary, sink or swim, you sink know. Or swim. So if it seems like I have a little bit more days off, it is because like I do live in my van. So like Dude, whatever you, you kind of need a little, yeah, a little bit more time to, to do stuff in that, you know, mental reset. So. Dude, that's so, I mean, like, Yes. To everything you just said. I mean, I definitely, you, well, you grew up in Chicago, you said. Yeah, I grew up like right outside of Chicago in Rockford, Illinois. Okay. Yeah. I've, and I've had this conversation with so many times with so many different homies who are from, not from California. And I don't say that in a negative way. Yeah. I say that as like, this is all I've ever known. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah, I've yeah. lived in other states. I've lived in Europe. I've lived other places, but traveling the world and gone around, it's like, dude, at the end of the day regardless of the area that you're in, when you say you live in California, you know what you're coming back to. You're coming back to some butteriness, like just some amazing, (laughs) amazing shit here. I love it. Um, And, you know, as a California boy, of course, I'm biased, but I've lived up and down the state. I've lived in the Southwest. I've lived on the East Coast and doing these things. And it's like, dude, there's no matter what. Like, it's, it's something here. And I, you know, I, this is all I've ever known, you yeah. know, so, but when I have homies from like Marysville, Ohio, <laughs> and they're like, dude, this is such fucking bullshit. I'm paying 1200 bucks for like a fucking room and in a house and blah, 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 blah. And it's like when I could go like space, like expend 600 bucks with a roommate and have like four bedrooms and a, and an acre in Marysville. And I was like, yeah, but dude, the key word there is Marysville. And he was like, I was like, I'm not 
shitting on where you're from. Yeah. I'm just saying you're paying for what you're getting totally. here and you're getting the California tax. That's what it is. Totally. Like, that's, I mean, you're coming here because the beach, uh, specifically San Diego, North Park. Great yeah. example. Like they just keep building fucking I houses it's here. It's insane. Dude, the it's high in, rises. And it's like, where are you? Okay. Where's the parking? Yes. First of all. Yes. Yes. But it's like, but see, that's the shit in my brain. I'm worried about parking. I'm not like, oh, the pain is you're yeah. paying what you're paying because that's, I, this is all I know. Yeah. I mean, I've lived here 19 years, lived in Illinois, 18. So I've, I'm officially, I think a San Diegan, but I'm 37. So I'm thinking about how can I own a house now? You know? So I'm looking Dude. at, that's why it's like the rent. Yes. If I had to do, I could, but I'm like, I'm finally starting to think for my future. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at little places out in Julian or different things that maybe I could afford. So that would be more your lifestyle anyway. That's though. more my lifestyle. You right? know, like, like I want to be, you know, gardening, put up, maybe put a little tiny roaster out there and <laughs> dude, that'd be fucking dope. Then yeah. you don't even have to pay anybody else for like, or like even a space. You just yeah. roast out of your garage. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm trying, you know, trying to think, I love San Diego. Like, like yeah. I said, 19 years, do or die. I don't want to, the only other place I lived was mammoth. And oh, you wow. know, that was beautiful. But yeah, I mean, I'm committed. So <laughs> however it takes and you know, I just get to move my house around every single day and night. So, you know, house I on mean, wheels. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just having this conversation yesterday and it's like, I'm not the only places. There's only three places that I will. Oh, I technically, I, no, it'd be three. There's only three places I'm moving. If I leave Cal, uh, San Diego specifically, it would be New York in the city, TJ or Mexico city. Hell yeah. Those, those are the only three cities I'm leaving San Diego for because I, I was just talking to my friend Durham about this. It's just like, dude, we both were feeling, it's like, if you leave, you lose your spot. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like my friend Katie, she just moved back to Boston, but she was like, she was, what did she say? She's like, Oh, you know, I, I think I'm going to come back. I was like, you're leaving. How old are you? And she's like, I'm 29. She's 29. She's like, I'm going to come back. Like I'm going to play. I'm like, dude, you're leaving. You're losing your spot. Like, yep, yeah. She's like, I know people who move here all the time. I'm like, yeah, but they have no other option. You have like, you're, you're going back to your option. Yeah. 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 Like they, f- they make it and they'll figure it out. But I was like, but once you leave, there's not really coming back. Yeah. You might get one time. Maybe you'll get lucky. You find your spot. Cool. Hold on to it. Boom. You're good. But yo, like it's really, it's getting harder and oh, yeah. harder because yeah. how many people say like i want to move to california how yeah. many people say i want to move to san diego well, and with the tech boom and those finances it's a little, a little different ball game than dude, yeah you know especially like where i'm from in the bay area like dude i would people ask me like uh, would you ever move back to uh, to the bay area i'm like not a chance i'm san diego just like you die hard i'm yeah. ready i'm like this is where i'm staying i'm gonna figure it out how to get a house and i'm gonna it, when there's a will there's a way it's yeah. gonna happen yeah i don't care how long it takes I'll, I'll start off at a town home or a condo, whatever the totally. fuck to get your property. Cause that's the only way you're going to make any money anyway. Exactly. Yeah. I'm like, that's the thing is like, I'm not giving another penny to all these greedy landlords in San Diego. You Dude, know what I mean? For real though. <laughs> like I'm, I'm like, I'll stay in my van for 10 more years if I have to. I mean, I don't want that, but I'm yeah. just saying I'm stubborn. Like I, I'm like until I own a house or land, like mm. this is, this is what I'm doing, you know? I, mean, I do have to say I do house sit pretty often. I got some friends, so you know it's like I like dog sit or whatever. So like I do have it pretty good. Like I, I love I absolutely love it. I don't want anyone to think that like I'm out here homeless and like having to live in my van. It <laughs> yeah. is my choice. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you know, like you get burnt out from it. But I love it. I can imagine. I mean, it definitely. I'm, I have a friend. I have a couple friends. I have two friends that I know uh, aside from you that that do that. They souped up their vans that like, and now they're just traveling around doing great things. But dude. It affords my one friend, Chris Russell, it affords him amazing opportunities to go to skate park. He's a pro skateboarder. That's what he does. But now he just hops in his van and he fucking just will go to anywhere mm-hmm. and he's fucking shredding and he's skating better than he's ever has. It's like, wow. Yeah. Like, you park at the skate park overnight. You sleep there and you wake up and skate whenever you want. And boom. yeah. Yeah. It just gives it that more like and anything you're doing, you're going out to Joshua tree. He'll go to a skate park. My friend Isaac does the same thing. He'll either stay with his girlfriend or stay with this, but he'll like, he's a geologist too. So he'll go out in the middle of fucking nowhere yeah. and just like dig in the middle of the night and then go sleep in his car oh, at yeah. the night. And he's just like, look at all these fucking rocks and special <laughs> things that I found. Look at this, like pointed it out, explaining the crystals and stuff. I'm just like, you dug that up from the earth, bro. <laughs> Hell like, yeah. Damn. You know, that's hella crazy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, respect, you know, mad respect. I mean, I wish I could do that, but like, I don't even, 
I don't know. I'm already so paranoid when I'm in my own house that mm-hmm. like about people coming in. I guess it's just because like how I grew up. But yeah, I feel that. Be, what are your biggest challenges going to sleep at night? Like you worried about shit? Like do you do you worry about people running up on you or nothing like that? Um, you know, like I, you know, I try to park in really safe areas. Uh, um, like I have some friends that I can park in front of their house. There's also a parking lot in San Diego. I'm not going to say where I don't blow the spot up. That's super safe, but I have parked over by my shop and like I've left in the middle of the night. Like, um, I had a friend held at gunpoint and they stole his van one time that was, and like, that was right by my spot. And, um, I mean, yeah, it's like you, sometimes I'm like, do I ever get really good sleep? I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I get good sleep, but like you hear everything. So it's like important to be safe. But my girlfriend and I just went from Minnesota to back to San Diego, driving her van back. So we were in like Yellowstone, Tetons. We're on, you know, BLM land. So it's free. And it's like, you sleep like a baby. Cause it's like, what's BLM land? So? Um, it's Bureau land management. So okay. it's uh, free land, right? So it's like pack it in, pack it out. So you're just like out in the middle of the mountains with the deer and, you know, wild all the life. wild animals, like, just parked on, you, you know, um, land that you're supposed to park on. And you sleep so good because you're not worried about it. once Once we get back to the city, it's like, you know, people are screaming, hollering. Um, there's one time I was sleeping in my van and um, in front of my friend's house, and some teenagers must have stole a car, right? And they smashed into a car that was, like, kitty corner from my van. Um and, like, I jumped up to the ceiling so loud because I thought I got hit. I was, like, I'm in heaven right now because, like, oh, I was dead shit. asleep and was, like, it was so loud. So it's, like, you're – I feel like, you know, but at the same time, like, people break into houses. Like, you same. know, shit yeah, happens. Yeah. So it's, like, I could tell you a million stories, but it's, like, um, I choose it. I love – I do love it. And it's, like, with anything, anything can happen anywhere. So, I mean, it definitely, like – there's nights where I'm like, shit happens. You just don't get a good night of sleep. Um, but then there's other times where like, you know, you're golden. So, Dope. so interesting. Dude, so <laughs> it interesting. is. It I've is. Always, I, I never I, thought like, if I look at myself at, you know, like a kid, like, okay, you're going to be 37. Um, and you're going to live in a van and you're going to own a coffee shop in San Diego. You know, I'd be like, what, what the heck? Like, you know, being from the Midwest too, and a female, like, I thought I'd be married with kids and live in a house and whatever. And I'm like, yeah. this is fucking rad. I think like teenager me would be like, you're fucking awesome. You know, and I, <laughs> I like you. That's cool, man. You live in a van. Like you that's just chill. do whatever you want. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, you that's know, great. it is what it is. <laughs> Dude. I, you know, I think to that point, I mean, dude, I, I think life changes either without you knowing or in an instant. Either way, you don't know. And I, I honestly, I, t- t- I think to the same thing like you. I thought by the time I was 36, I would be like married, have a kid, do this. Like maybe, you know, old and slowing down. And it's like I'm thir- 36, about to be 37. And my life is nowhere near what I thought it was. You're just getting started. Dude, it's not even getting started. It's like completely restarting mm-hmm. i did get married mm. uh now divorced and it's like and i don't i don't shy away from that because i don't think there's anything wrong with not, saying that not at all and it's like i knew what was best for me and what i needed to do and i've um you know i've learned a lot and it was hard and things my life completely 180 you know the the ultimate dream was always opening up a coffee shop so it's like that has still not changed but the way i got there was like this zigzagged rigmarole (laughs) fucking who knew what it would be and i think if i were to talk to my like teenage self i'd be like what happened (laughs) what did you do like damn dude you're fucking crazy like i kind of get weird in the in my older years i guess i would think but (laughs) it would be like it's just it's so i don't know man i think what do you think what what for you what has been your like aside from opening the shop has there been like a moment where you were like, this is it. Like I've kind of arrived. Cause I mean, like you could say oh, opening your shop, you arrived. But what I've seen when I've opened up other coffee shops and then open and in opening this, it wasn't opening the shop for me that it was like, I arrived. It was putting that mural on the wall. It was like, it's real now. Like, all right, let's get the shit popping. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Was there any, have you had any of those moments? Yeah, I think, I think, um, 
I had I had a business partner really briefly for a couple of months when I first opened. It was like when we dissolved his partnership and then I was like on my own and it was mine. I think that's when I was like, oh, my God, like I, I'm doing it. I'm, I did it. And then it's same when I got the roaster. Yeah. I think anything that makes you feel scared shitless, like, you know what I mean? Like kind of in a commitment, like you're just like, wow, like I, I did it. I manifested all of this. Like yep. I knew like I would own a car. I envisioned it like before I even knew what manifesting was. Now, if I try to manifest, I think too much and think shit's not happening. But it's like I know like. I see myself, I'm going to own a coffee shop. That's what I'm going to do. And then I knew I was going to be a roaster. I'm like, I don't care if anyone's going to give me a chance to roast. Like, I'm going to roast. And th- and that's just kind of what happened. Like, maybe it was COVID, like, leading me to that. Maybe I never would have, um, I would have been too scared to do it, you know, any other time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I, I feel like, you know, like I said, like imposter syndrome a little bit. I'm like, I haven't really done shit. That's how I feel, you know. I know it's not true, but... Dude, no, I, I completely agree because I don't, I don't take time for myself to recognize what I've done because I haven't arrived yet. Like mm-hmm. I'm not there. Yeah. But yet everything I like, it's like when you like take a second and you like hypothetically turn around and look at what you've done. It's like, whoa, like, okay. Yeah. Like, I guess you kind of did everything you said you were going to do. Time to write a new list out, right? You know? And it's like, I, I, I quote, I, I think about my friend Mike Morosco all the time and he's, He's the one who kind of like flipped the switch for me. I mean, I always, like I said, I always knew I was going to be a coffee shop owner and I was going to, uh, I wrote it down. Like by 35, I'm going to open up my own coffee shop, yeah. you know, kind of thing. And it was 36. So it was, it was like a couple, like a year later, but I did that. I manifested it. I made it happen. And I'm like you, like, I'm going to do it either way. I, I have the knowledge. I'm just going to keep getting better. I was scared shitless. I keep doing this. But Mike Morosco, he told me he was like, yo, I just started writing shit down. And then he's like, soon enough, things became easier and easier and easier to do. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, I got to a point where I was like, fuck, I got to write new goals. Yeah. And oh, Okay, yeah. well, I guess I'm going to do this. And then he surpassed that one and surpassed that one. And now he's like this amazing... He owns a film company called Raw Media and they do, he did all of Jay-Z and Beyonce stuff. And oh, it's like, yeah. this dude I grew up skating with, <laughs> I filmed him break his knee, literally break his Damn. knee. And now he's this guy who just has an amazing house in the Hollywood Hills and he made it all himself and he did it with his wife and he, he knew Nip. Like he Hell was yeah. Nipsey Hussle's personal filmer for a long time. And it's like, he just kept manifesting. And he like, he also was like, you know, money wasn't a thing, meaning like, he took his last five thousand dollars that he had and to his name, because he got a thousand dollar budget on a uh, Juicy J. His first project was a Juicy J music video, wow. and then he took the rest of his life savings, which was five thousand dollars at the time, and put it all in. And he's like, "And I was broke as fuck when I finished the project, and it was the worst project I've ever done. But it afforded me to get two to three other jobs that helped me replenish that and get him to the point where it needed to be." Oh yeah. And it was like. He just looked at me. He's like, Connor, you need to make some big boy moves. He's like, it's time for you to open up your own shop. You got to do it. And I was just like, damn. Yeah. Like, all right. Like, he didn't let shit stop him. Yeah. Dude, I like literally people are like, you a trust fund baby? Or like, how'd you open a shop? And I'm like, look, I worked two jobs, two coffee shop jobs from 20 to 28. And then 20 to 30, I worked one job. I quit my job. Didn't really have a whole lot of money. I this opportunity came up. I borrowed five grand from two friends. I had good credit, got a credit card and my shop was kind of intact. Like I had some equipment and stuff, so I didn't have to pay for the full build out, but like still starting something with 10 grand, like I be- I bootstrapped it. You know, the shop never had money. It's still, do- it's about to, right? I'm manifesting it and we're getting going, but like you can open it as a brief. Like I didn't have, I had nothing. You know what I mean? I paid my friends back right away and, you know, always never burn a bridge. Always make sure everyone's paid before myself. But Honey. Um, and I know like Will from Scrimshaw too, like he, he did that. You know what I mean? He built his shop out. He he killed it in that way. And I, and I love those stories of like bootstrapping your businesses. People really don't understand you're like you know, the hustle is completely different. You know what I mean? Did you put everything into it? Like, I'm like, if I had a hundred grand to open my shop and I can just do whatever I want, it's like, where's that love and, and passion and all that for your, it's like, you know what I mean? It's your everything. Like, wh- you know what I mean? Like, I don't have any, I don't have any outside income. I don't have, 
you know, that's, that's, that's it for me. So it's like sink or swim, right? You got to make yep. it work. <laughs> Dude, it's just like Nip said, Nip always says all money in. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Like all money in, no money out. And it's like, I really wish that no money out was like yeah. really true right now. But like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah. was the whole thing. And that's like, Dude, no, I same like it takes like five years essentially, but it doesn't have that's to. That's what they say. That's what yeah. they say. But that, you know, it doesn't. It's how hard are you gonna grind? Yeah. And that's what it is. Is like, you know, I I find a lot of similarities in like our stories in the sense of like you've already done it, and it's like that's what I'm I'm in it right now. Yeah. And you're I mean you're in it, but you just took your three week like thing, yeah. and it's like, dude, I'm right there with you, like working the every day. I'm doing it by myself, but I'm grinding, and I'm like trying to still make shit work. And it's like, okay, let's fucking go. Yeah. Like, you know, I love that, like, bootstrapping. That's yeah. what, dude, you know, it's so funny. It's like, how did you do it? It's like, yeah, I had, I pulled money out of nowhere. Like, I, I sunk everything, mm -hmm. everything into this business. Is it going to work? Fucking better. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. you're going to have to go. And it's like, just like you said, making sure that people are paid on time. Mm -hmm. Like, barely taking, like, I only took one investor, and it was a friend, mm -hmm. and it was at the end because I needed to get this like last bill paid yep. and that was it. Every like, dude, my cart, everything, everything paid off Hell on yeah. my own. That's so awesome. that was fine. So it was like, I remember getting the carts and I was looking, I was like, fucking a, like <laughs> you did that shit. Like yeah. good shit, yeah. bro. Like yeah. hell yeah. You know? And it's, you made it happen. Everything else in here, like people think they can't do it or you have to get the most expensive shit. Dude, almost everything in here is bought off Amazon. No, dude, like literally like people, like not, not, in, not hating on like, you know, bird rock or those types of places. Like, but they have the funds, they have the financials. Like when you're opening your first shop and you're a little person, like you don't need to shoot. You can aim for that at some point, but when mm -hmm. you're opening, just open your doors people will come like it like yep. my la marzocco so was so old but that thing's like a honda civic it's gonna go three hundred thousand <laughs> miles like i have it fixed whatever like i'm yep. not paying 12 grand for you know a new machine like i don't have it i yeah. literally have to work with what i have like you know and things come up to like i had to replace a grease strap at the end of the pandemic that was sixty eight hundred dollars oh that drained any money that i like you know i thought like oh we're gonna break even this whatever and shit happens like it was out of my control there's nothing you can do like you know like whenever you think you know what i'm saying you just have dude, you're no, on I your know. tippy toes like shit yeah. like fridges break like whatever so it's like dude just start with what you have that's what i did and like people come in and you're fine like you i see a lot of places that they spend a lot of money and then they go out of business right away because they you know they start so in the hole um and it's like keep your ego in check. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not about appearance. It's about personal relationship with your customers. Like people are going to like you or, or they're not going to like you. They're not going to care if you have the fanciest espresso machine. Right. Dude, at the end of the day, it's the experience that you're giving to your customer. Exactly. How do you make them feel? And that goes back to the beginning of the conversation yeah. when you were saying like what you're, what you're able to do, you're talking to your customer base, your clients, yep. your people, you're creating that like, not the community part, but you're learning them. And yeah. like you're, you have the ability to turn Sophie's day around. That's what the name you said. Yeah. It was like, dude. Yeah. Like fuck. Yeah. Every day my, like one of our regulars, Matt comes in and I'm just like, Matt was popping. He's like, Oh, I went to this show last night. I went to this, I this. And they love that. Yeah. Cause you have that rapport with them and yeah. you know about their lives and what they're going through and they feel special. Yes. You yes. Know what I'm that's, that's it right there. Like they could care less about, you know, your espresso machine. I mean, it's nice to look good, but like you can look good on a budget. <laughs> Dude. Yeah. And I mean, you know, what's super interesting is like so many people, I mean, especially in North park, like people are like, there are coffee snobs and there's oh, people yeah. like that, but I bet you those same people, like they'll go into a coffee shop and be like, this place is good, but like, I like my spot better. And yeah. it's like, yeah, the coffee might be shit or the coffee might be actually exceptional. So if you can do exceptional coffee and create an experience, then that's like even harder to break because totally. like when you take, uh, they, they'd be like, Oh, I do this. But then you, when you walk in, not only are you getting the best coffee, but you're getting like the recognition and you feel special. Like you no, and there's not one person I know that like, if you're going to go to a bar and it's your local bar and you walk in and Steve's behind the bar and Steve knows who Tim is, what's <laughs> up Tim? And he's like, ah. Yeah, What's yeah. up, Steve? You know, like, I was like, regular today. Like, yeah, let me get that one. All right. No, not today. Oh, and then it's like, what are you going to get today? And you know, type uh, of shit, yeah. you know? So it's like, that sounds so cliche, mm -hmm. but dude, I love that shit. Yeah. Almost everybody I know loves that shit. And they feel like they belong. Yeah, dude. That's the, that's like 
customer service one. I tell my employees and they hire, I'm like, look, you, you customers can have two different experiences, right? You can pay attention to what you're making and making the drink properly and give them good customer service. Or like they can come and you can half ass their drink and be like, eh, and not really care about them. And they're going to have two different experiences. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, you have the opportunity to like, to, to like give them this experience. And I think that like flipped the switch with like newer people in customer service because they start to get it. You know, I'm like, pay attention when you go other places now that you're a barista. I, I own a coffee shop, right? It doesn't make me shit, but when I go into other local spots and I get treated like shit by baristas or just like what, like it happens a lot. Like there are so many baristas in San Diego that just kind of like, um, doing their own thing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like they, they, they don't care that you're there. Like you're bothering them you know yeah by ordering mm. like can i get a cold brew and it's just like i actually went to a place that i i usually respect a lot like not too long ago and it, it was a barista i'd never seen and like there was no customer service aspect whatever and i was kind of like dude that sucks because like i would love to tell everyone go here go here but like that was so rude it was just weird you know what i'm saying because well, like, you own a business so you know yeah i know and like i don't go around being like oh i own a coffee shop like i don't i don't do that and like i don't need to be known but i'm just saying it's like don't give your homies like a special like yo what's up da, da, da. like treat everyone that way um yeah. i mean we all have our days like i've i've definitely delivered bad customer service before but i think you know, that's what sets people apart. And it's like, when I feel that, when I go into a shop, I'm like, that's not cool. You know what I mean? Like, it's 100%. not, especially when it's not your shop, you know? Oh, yeah. It's like, you want to tell your friends, like, hey, your employee, like, sucks. But I would never do that. But I'm just saying, like. I would definitely, I, see, I feel like I would respectfully disagree. I think if I knew the owner of that shop, I'd be like, yo, real quick, dude, I'm saying this as out of love. But you should probably check that barista right there. Maybe yeah. just like t check in with them. Be like, are you That's all right? Yeah, are you yeah, good? Yeah. Like, are you cool? Because like, a like, you know, somebody came in and th we didn't get a complaint, but they just said it was uh, noticeable yeah. or something like that. That's true. Because I do, dude. I find myself highly critical now of customer service mm -hmm. specifically. And every time I've either hired an employee or like right now, I'm talking about Natasha training her. I've dude, the biggest thing for me is customer service. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, and I say this at nauseum. I say, we are not in the business of creating a one-time customer. Yes. We're in the business of creating a repeat customer. Yes. And what do we do that with? Attention to detail, customer service. Hey, how are you doing today? Yeah. You know what, Danny, you know what? You came in today, your fucking girlfriend broke up with you and you're a wreck. Okay. Can you work today? Yes. You need to make some money. Okay. Compartmentalize. Boom. Yes, Leave yes, that yes, shit yes. at the door. Yeah. I know you're going to be tough. Like, it's going to be tough today, but Hey, we have to like, for all of us to eat, we have to be super nice yes. to everybody walking through that door. Yeah, yeah. So when they come in, boyfriend just broke up with me, girlfriend just broke up with me, whatever. I'm just like, Hey, how's it going today, Tim? You doing all right. Hey, like, yo, let me get that mocha for you. All right, cool. And then like, but it's also comes with time Yeah. because yeah. I, I, I've dude, I was going through my divorce when I was still working roasting. So it's like, you have moments where you have to walk out. Dude, yeah. I think, like, it's um exactly, like, the older you get, you're able to compartmentalize. Like, I feel with, like, the younger staff, you know, like, your emotions are so much different when you're younger and things are a lot bigger deal. So, like, you know, we work a lot on that with my staff as well, is, like, how can we help whatever you're going through? And, like, it's hard, right? Because you're dealing with hundreds of customers a day or whatever. And customers aren't always nice either. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I do give a benefit of the doubt. Like for the most part, I do have, you know, I feel like San Diego has good customer service, but it's that, you know, like not having that barista attitude or those different things and being able to compart, com yeah, that word, but um, <laughs> knowing to having compassion that people are going through stuff too. Cause exactly. I agree. I've gone through some really gnarly stuff. And like the last thing I want to do is talk to a customer that's asking me what every single thing on my menu is and you're just exhausted, you know, yeah. but it's like, um, I think, yeah, you know what I mean? As you get older and stuff, you learn, like you just gotta, you gotta do it. You know what I mean? Just gotta suck it up. Yeah. I do think it's helped me quite a bit though, having the podcast too. Cause I just find I can I just talk to people. Yeah. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Like, hey, definitely. Let's find something to find some common ground on. Yeah, you know? definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's always, I always say like two, it's like, you know, if you get your focus off yourself, mm-hmm like a lot of your problems will go away or you're able to compartmentalize better because it's like focus on what other people are doing or what they're going through. Like in, if you're not like so focused on yourself, it, you know, might be helpful, might be more positive and it's a uh, distraction. Yeah. Work is a distraction yeah. that can take you away from that. Definitely. So yeah, I feel that. 
dude, well, we just did an hour and a half. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> dude, that <laughs> was yeah. super easy. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's been fun. Well, dude, is, uh, you know, we've covered a lot, but you know, just to kind of wrap it up, I mean, I would say let people know where they can find you. Um, and then, you know, give them the address, tell them where they could see you. Like if, if you are coming in roasting or whatever, like, or just any upcoming events or anything. Awesome. So Altria Coffee's at 4653 College Avenue, um, San Diego, California on College and El Cajon Boulevard. We're open seven to six every day. Um, you can find us on Instagram, Altria underscore coffee. And we have like open mic nights, the second and fourth Tuesdays of every night or every month. And then thrift Thursdays, uh, the second and fourth Thursdays. And then we also do pop-ups. So if you follow us on Instagram, you can find all of our community events on there. And I roast twice a week at the shop on various different days. Sick, uh, and sick. then our website's altreacoffeeandtea.com. Again, my name's Danny. Can you spell Altrea? Just for people. Yeah, it's U-L-T-R-E-Y-A. And it also means journey onward. Yes, I was going to say, that was like, what does that mean? Yep. Dude, fuck yeah. Well, Danny, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I thought it was, a su- I think, like again, more similarities than uh, yeah. uh, differences. And dude, I think it's fucking rad. Keep uh, keep doing everything you're doing. And like I always tell everybody, you know, this will not be the last time you're on the show. Uh, anything you have big coming up or big news for the show, like our big news from the shop, tell, come on the show. If you want to share it, do whatever or just promote anything you need. Just let me know. Hell yeah. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. I'm super, super happy to be here. Dude, stoked. Cool. Thank you so much, Danny. Yeah. Peace. Peace. Yes, thank you so much, Danny. That was an amazing conversation. And man, I I had no idea of like everything that she had to go through and just how hard she hustles and you know doing everything on her own. You know, mad, mad respect to Danny. So guys, head on over to Altrea Coffee and check her out if you're ever in the college area. Danny, thank you again. And I just want to say thank you to, again to everybody around the world who continues to support Caffeine and Green. I see you, Poland. I see you, Australia, France, Brazil. Argentina, yo, mad love. Everybody around the United States who continues to support Caffeine and Green, I appreciate all of you for listening week in, week out. Mad love. And guys, if you haven't yet, make sure you're cruising on to the, the end of the coffee shop, 3072 El Cajon Boulevard. Closed Mondays, Tuesday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Sundays, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And guys, that's it. We have some great guests coming next week, and I am super excited, and I will share it with y'all very soon. But until then, peace!